Today's video is brought to you by Surfshark, but more about them later. It's the longest bridge in the whole of Europe, an 18.1 kilometer or over 11 mile span that unrolls above sandy islands and vast expanses of water. Opened in 2018, the Kerch Strait Bridge is the beast that knocked the previous record holder, Portugal's Ponte Vasco de Gama, off the top spot. Costing over $3.5 billion and utilizing 12.5 million tons of material, everything about it is gigantic. An engineering feat of a size and scope rarely seen in modern Europe. But while today's subject is certainly a marvel of engineering, it's also something else. A vital supply line for a genocidal regime unleashing a terror war on its peaceful neighbor. A symbol of Vladimir Putin's totalitarian state and its ongoing aggression against Ukraine. Designed to connect the Russian mainland with annexed Crimea, the Kerch Strait Bridge played a key role in the 2022 invasion of Ukraine. Yet it also wound up becoming the scene of one of Moscow's greatest humiliations. Spectacularly blown up by Ukraine's forces last October, the bridge is now best known to the wider world as a flaming wreck. A symbol no longer of Russian strength, but of Putin's impotence. Today, Mega Project is telling the story of both the Kerch Bridge and the Ukrainian attack that awed the world. Fittingly for a structure built on the orders of Vladimir Putin, the idea of a bridge crossing the Kerch Strait was first proposed by another Russian autocrat who'd soon plunge his nation into a catastrophic war. In 1903, Tsar Nicholas II pushed for his energetic finance minister, Saregi Oite, to develop the concept, part of a wider drive to modernize the empire. But before anything could come of it, Nicholas went and provoked the Russo-Japanese War, leading to Moscow's swift defeat and a revolution on the streets. By the time society had sufficiently calmed down to try any bridge building, Witter had left his post and taken all of his energy with him. So the bridge was still only a dream by the time the Bolshevik Revolution rolled around and deposed Nicholas once and for all. As a result, the honor of attempting to lay the first bridge from Crimea to Russia went not to the Tsarist system, but rather to Nazi Germany. The year was 1943. Two years earlier, Hitler's forces had attacked the USSR, sweeping through modern Ukraine and Belarus, spreading terror in their wake. By summer 1942, Crimea had fallen. To help resupply German forces on their drive into the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, a simple cable car system was established between the city of Kerch and the Russian settlement of Taman. But it would be in 1943 that the real engineering work began. That year, Albert Speer floated the idea of a combined rail and road bridge to replace the cable car, one which would help bolster the faltering German invasion. Sadly for the Nazis, though, this would turn out to be a bridge too far. With construction only semi-completed, work was forced to stop as the Red Army began to counterattack. With the Soviets bearing down, the Germans blew up what little of the bridge they'd managed to build. Not that this stopped Stalin's forces. By spring of 1944, the Red Army had retaken Crimea, something Stalin celebrated by having all of its indigenous inhabitants rounded up and deported for not resisting the Nazis. Some 200,000 Crimean Tatars were forcibly removed from their homeland and shipped to Uzbekistan. Tens of thousands died in transit. From 98% of the peninsula's population when the Russian Embar arrived in 1783, the Tatars now made up 0%. As always, Stalin's latest ethnic cleansing campaign had been as effective as it was brutal. By 1945, it was impossible to tell Crimea had ever been anything but Russian. But that's a story for later in today's video. For now, we'll simply note that the Soviets finally accomplished what the Nazis could not. At the very end of the war, they built the first bridge to successfully cross the Kerch Strait. Now, Successful here is a relative term. At just 4.5 kilometers long, the Soviet railway bridge directly crossed the shortest point, leaving it highly exposed to adverse climatic events. And this became painfully clear that same spring, when large ice flows carried down from the Sea of Azov crashed into the bridge, destroying it as effectively as any bomb. With the railway link destroyed, the Soviets didn't bother to rebuild it. It was simply too much work. It was too expensive, too prone to disaster. From that point until the collapse of the USSR, the main way of crossing the strait would be by ferry. It would only be once the Soviet Empire was nothing but ashes that Tsar Nicholas II's old dream of a bridge would finally be revived. Do you ever feel like someone's constantly watching over your shoulder when you're browsing online? 
You don't know who it is, but they could be there. A hacker, the government, who knows? Or maybe you just want to be able to watch all your favorite shows and movies, no matter where you are in the world. Well, look, Surfshark is gonna help you with both of those things. Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network that keeps you safe and private by covering everything you do online. It covers you up much like your pants do when you go outside. With Surfshark VPN, you can travel the world virtually and access popular websites and streaming platforms with ease. You can even change your virtual location and get past geo blocks and government restrictions. And the best part, of course, you can secure yourself online and protect sensitive information when you send or receive files. Plus, you get the best deals on shopping online by shopping from different locations. They also offer add-on security combo features like Surfshark Alert, Antivirus, and Search. With 3,200 servers in 100 countries, GPS spoofing on Android, and multi-op, Surfshark VPN is a force to be reckoned with. And there is more. You get 24-7 customer support. There are no logs kept because they got 100% RAM-only servers. And there's also a cookie pop-up blocker, IP rotator, website safety warnings, and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Deep breath. So what are you waiting for? Use the promo code MEGA for 83% off and three months for free at surfshark.deals forward slash MEGA or click the link in the description below and surf the web safely and securely. And now back to today's video. Now, before we get to the modern day bridge, we first have to take a quick detour and ask why. Why were the Soviets so content to leave the project unfinished? And the answer to that's simple. The Kerch Strait is one of the worst building environments in the world. The first thing to note is the sheer amount of silt collected below its waters. In order to drive pillars into stable bedrock, you'd have to dig through some 60 meters or nearly 200 feet of mud, and even then stability uh, will be just a dream. Crimea, you see, sits on a fault line. Directly below the strait, two tectonic plates rub up against one another, making the area inherently unstable. This often manifests in the form of mud volcanoes, peaks of silt that can rise up out of the earth to disrupt any building work going on above them. And that's before we even get into the irregular climactic events, like the way the strait channels winds to gale force levels, or the seasonal ice flows like the one that took out the Soviet era bridge. Hence why the USSR was happy to just use a ferry service. Hence why, even after the Soviet Union collapsed, no one in newly independent Ukraine was particularly interested in restarting the project. But post-Soviet Russia was down with building Tsar Nicholas's bridge. And that was all for a very important reason. When Ukraine left the USSR, Crimea had gone with it. Back in 1954, you see, Nikita Khrushchev had transferred the peninsula to the control of the Ukrainian SSR as part of the 300-year celebrations of Russian-Ukrainian unity. Since the Crimean Tatars had all been genocided by Stalin, there were no indigenous inhabitants left to complain. And in the context of 1954, it was little more than a formality. Both Ukraine and Russia were in the USSR, so... What difference did it make? But then the Soviet Union collapsed, leaving Russia with a long-term lease on the Crimean naval base in Sevastopol, but without unimpeded access to it. As early as 1991, right after Kyiv declared independence, Moscow was pushing for a bridge across the Kerch Strait. Not that the request ever seemed to go anywhere. By 2010, all the Russians had gotten was a memorandum of understanding on one day constructing the crossing. Even after Putin's man in Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, took power, it took until 2013 for things to inch towards a formal agreement. Sadly for Moscow, 2013 was also when Ukrainians would finally decide that they'd had enough of being under Russia's jackboot. The Revolution of Dignity was Ukraine's answer to the American Revolution, throwing off a hated imperialist oppressor, albeit one that preferred gargling vodka to sipping tea. After Putin pressured Yanukovych to back out of a campaign promise to sign an association agreement with the EU, ordinary Ukrainians took to Kyiv streets, setting up a protest camp in the public square known as Maiden. But rather than be all like, whoops, silly me, maybe I should sign that agreement after all, Yanukovych was more like, screw that, how about we shoot some protesters? The violence would culminate in February 2014 with the murder of over 100 protesters by police snipers. The outcry that followed forced Yanukovych to flee the country, and across Ukraine people erupted in celebration. In Crimea, though, it would be a different story. 
Within days of the revolution, Russian soldiers in unmarked uniforms had appeared across the peninsula, seizing strategic sites. On March 16, 2014, a sham referendum was held on incorporating Crimea into the Russian Federation. The results showed 96% in favor and an 80% turnout. It was only two months later that someone in the Kremlin leaked the true results. A turnout of barely 30%, with only slightly over half favoring union with Putin's police state. By then, though, it was far too late. Russia illegally annexed Crimea on March the 18th, 2014. Less than a year later, in early January 2015, Vladimir Putin made a surprise announcement. Moscow would finally build a bridge across the Kerch Strait, a bridge that uh, wouldn't just be used as a means of transporting goods, but as a symbol showing Crimea uh, would be occupied forever. So, this is where we come to the slightly awkward part of today's episode. The part where we have to reconcile the fact that the Kurt Strait Bridge is simultaneously a hated symbol of violence, but also an engineering marvel. For some, the idea that we're about to dig into the impressive aspects of this project might be a bit distasteful, the equivalent of watching someone geek out over Mussolini's flower arrangements. To which, all we'd say in our defense is that we've covered controversial stuff before without endorsing it, like when we did a video on Hitler's plans for a new capital city called Germania. And hey, fingers crossed, the two ideas will soon share an ending, just as soon as Putin gets around to shooting himself in his bunker and all. Anyway, 2015 began with Russia now in control of Crimea and covertly fermenting war in eastern Ukraine. For Arkady Rottenberg, though, it began with a windfall. A childhood friend of Putin's, Rottenberg, was the guy who eventually won the $3.7 billion Kerch Bridge contract through his infrastructure firm known as SGM, which is something in Russian that I'm not going to try and pronounce. Never mind that SGM had never built a bridge before. Never mind, too, that the cost of the Kerch Bridge would be so great that Moscow would have to practically stop building roads elsewhere for the duration. The new Tsar wanted his bridge, and a bridge he would have. All that said, though, what Rottenberg and SGM eventually pulled off was nothing short of impressive. To deal with the harsh weather conditions, the firm constructed three temporary bridges to transport people and equipment to the site. To deal with the geological challenges, they employed over 7,000 piles, driven 90 meters into the silt and the bedrock below. These were driven in an angle, so the whole thing, theoretically, wouldn't collapse in an earthquake. To overcome the intense currents in the strait, they used thin pylons around the pillars, pylons with enough space between them to let the waters sweep by without much friction. The spans, meanwhile, were designed to be wide enough to allow the seasonal ice flows to drift through. But it wasn't just nature that posed challenges. Over 200 World War II bombs were still sitting in the silt, bombs that had to be located by divers and carefully disposed of. These difficulties were repeated across the whole 18.1 kilometer span of the bridge, a span that crossed two swaths of open water between 5.5 kilometers and 6.4 kilometers wide, as well as running for over six kilometers along the sandy island of Tuzla. They also had to make it incredibly tall. With a major shipping route running through the Kerch Strait, the firm was forced to build arches that would have a clearance of 35 meters below them or 114 feet. Because these arches were also nearly a quarter of a kilometer long, they had to be built on land before being shipped out and put in place. By early 2018, the road section was finished, a section intended to see up to 40,000 cars per day. While the two railroad lines would take until 2020 to open, it seemed like SGM had done the impossible. They'd finally built the last SARS longed for bridge. That May 2018, Vladimir Putin personally drove across the bridge to declare it open. A grand PR gesture, if there ever was one. Yet even in Russia, not everybody was cheering. Despite Arkady Rottenberg seemingly pulling off the impossible, a small number of engineers were saying that the design was too unstable, that the pilings needed to have been sunk much deeper into the bedrock to protect against earthquakes. Some even warned that a natural disaster could soon bring it crashing down. Yet it wouldn't be a disaster that caused a long section of Putin's prized bridge to collapse just four years after it opens. Rather, it would be the Russian dictator's foolish decision to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the toughest nations on Earth. In the aftermath of the Ukrainian bomb that destroyed 275 meters of roadways, 900 feet, Kremlin propagandists loudly declared that the Kerch Strait Bridge was civilian infrastructure and shouldn't have been targeted. But if that had ever been true, it certainly wasn't true in the fall of 2022. During Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the Kerch Strait Bridge functioned as a key supply line, supporting Moscow's troops as they stole territory and committed war crimes in southern Ukraine. 
By summer, the Ukrainian military was tweeting memes about attacking the bridge, a promise the Kremlin seemed determined to make sure they couldn't fulfill. According to Russian propaganda at the time, the bridge was guarded with the best equipment that Moscow could throw at it. There were radar reflectors, giant smoke screens that could hide the entire 18.1 kilometer span. Uh, there were even meant to be, and this is an actual military quote here, trained military dolphins that would defend it. Not that even the Russians seemed to believe the Kremlin's reassurances. In mid-August 2022, the bridge saw its heaviest single day of traffic in history. Following a Ukrainian attack on Saki airfield, over 38,000 cars fled Crimea for Russia, creating tailbacks across the strait. But it would be what came in October that really shocked Moscow. An attack that, in its ingenuity, is arguably as great a megaproject as the bridge itself. In the early morning of October the 8th, a truck passed along the roadway part of the near-empty bridge. At 6.08 a.m., it pulled level with the train carrying fuel tanks on the parallel rail bridge just as it reached the halfway point between two massive concrete pillars holding up the roadway. This last bit is important because halfway between these pillars was one of the structure's weakest points, the exact sort of place that you'd need to exert a whole lot of force if you wanted to collapse it. A whole lot of force, say, like a giant truck bomb. You probably remember the images from that morning, the gigantic fireball that engulfed the bridge, the blast that shook the confidence of everybody in Russia. As the bomb went off, it took out the span the truck was driving along, the pressure of the blast collapsing a full 275 meters of roadway into the rushing waters below. At the same time, it caused the fuel the parallel train was carrying to ignite, starting a fire that disabled the railway portion. Structural engineering experts later told the New York Times that the bomb had gone off seemingly oh, with the precision of a demolition charge. It exploded in the perfect place, at the perfect time, and it caused catastrophic damage. Even today, several months later, the full story of how this happened remains a mystery. Was it a suicide attack? Did the driver know he was steering a gigantic bomb and deliberately timed it so that he'd take out the train too? Or was it a lucky coincidence that the blast damaged two bridges with one stone? The Ukrainians certainly aren't willing to say. The closest comment that we got was oh, when one official tweeted a picture of the bridge in flames with the simple caption, sick burn. But while the damage to the bridge was spectacular and undoubtedly robbed the Russian war machine of a vital supply line, it wasn't the last chapter in the project's life. No. The final end of the Kerch Strait Bridge is a story that's still being written. Devastating as the truck bomb was, it wasn't quite the apocalyptic blast that many would have liked to have seen. While huge chunks of road fell into the water and fire severely damaged one rail line, it's not like the bridge itself sank beneath the waves. Barely had the blast debris been cleared than a light traffic had resumed. Still, it wasn't light traffic that Ukraine was worried about. It was heavy military equipment and supplies crossing the bridge that they objected to. Heavy supplies the Russian army now had to shift across on time-consuming ferry journeys. At the time, it was hoped that the bridge would remain out of action until the summer of 2023. An initial assessment noted that under ordinary circumstances, the bridge would be impassable until July of that year. But these were not normal circumstances. Angry, humiliated Putin threw everything he could at reconstruction. That meant floating cranes being deployed to remove the destroyed spans. It meant replacing concrete pads that had been cracked by the force of the blast. By the end of the year, prefab pieces of road had been hauled into place. After an intense period of laying asphalt and fixing up the lighting, the road part was ready to go. In mid-December 2022, Putin again drove across the bridge to signal that it was open. On January the 26th, 2003, the Kremlin announced that the Kerch Bridge was fully repaired and open for use. Less than four months after the bomb disabled it, Putin's toy uh, was working again, restored to its former glory. Or was it? Speaking to a new civil engineer, University of Sheffield Department of Civil Engineering, Blast and Impact Dynamics Research Associate Andrew Barr suggested that the repair had been a rush job, one which had traded long-term safety on the bridge for short-term use. As Barr put it, quote, I'm not sure to what extent structural checks of the existing concrete piers have been carried out. The main risk for these will be that small cracks created during the explosion and collapse of the decks would allow seawater to enter and corrode the steel reinforcement. Quote ends. That could spell trouble in the future. Costly and expensive trouble. Although it's equally possible that the Kerch Strait Bridge won't survive long enough for any of that to matter. As a hated symbol of Russian occupation, the bridge is high on Ukraine's list of targets. If summer 2023 sees Kyiv's forces advance, it's highly likely they'll go after it. Maybe not with a truck bomb this time, but with HIMARS missiles or a ground-launched small diameter bomb. 
Should Ukraine actually win the war and retake Crimea, it's impossible to imagine the bridge will be left to stand. If Russia is driven out, then expect the structure to vanish along with them. Consigned to history alongside the Soviet bridge of the 1940s. And to be honest, this would be the best ending imaginable. While our bread and butter on this channel is geeking out over awesome mega structures, that doesn't mean we're entirely above politics. As amazing as something might be on an engineering level, we could be happy to accept that something could be an overall force for bad in the world. And the Kurt Strait Bridge falls into that category. An impressive technical feat that's now being used to wage an unjust and genocidal war. A marvel of construction born from a seed of pure evil. We can only hope that a hundred years from now, people think of it the way that we do Nazi megastructures. A piece of the past. A broken remnant of a warmongering regime that thankfully was lost to history long, long ago.